Good morning, everybody. I'm Matt Wagner. I own Hellion Gallery. I wanted to explain a little bit about what I do. I sort of feel like my gallery is, operates in a bit of a gray area. Um, there's galleries that, that try to sell high-end art and try to like in, intentionally work with stars, and it's about producing money and kind of having hits, even one-hit wonders. And then there's galleries who predominantly work with like local, craft-oriented, and you know, they just, they're a lower end kind of gallery, lower price point. I'm trying to make my gallery fall into a middle area, an area where an artist actually could have a career, can actually make a viable income. Um, I sort of feel like artists these days are, are like Harrison Bergeron. They're like handicapped, you know, before they even get started. They, they, they tend to have all these things stacked against them. And so I feel like they fit with the theme bravery because they have insurmountable odds and they're able to overcome them. So I predominantly work with international artists, um, some local artists. Um, I have a couple books out. My first book, uh, Tall Trees of Tokyo, is uh, about Japanese artists. And my second book, uh, Tall Trees of Portland, will be out in March. And it's about our Portland artists here. Um, my approach is selling the artists, not really selling the art. Um, the artists have the most important story because they're, they're the, that's what people are interested in. What they make is like a byproduct of who they are. So with that, my first fantastic slide that I spent hours in Photoshop on. Um, oh, I went right past it. <laughs> so I just got back from Tokyo um, like at the end of last week. And it kills me that no matter where I go, the same thing happens. I'll, I'll somewhere be setting with someone, and someone outside of the creative community will make the exclamation of like, what, what does he do for a day job? So the artist, Mock, who is, this is a page from my book. This is his profile. Um, this is some of his art. He was painting at a coffee roaster in Tokyo. And they wanted the windows painted, and they wanted the coffee roaster painted. And afterwards, we were all sitting at a bar talking about what was going on. And I ran into this American guy. And he started discussing with me about my book and everything. And he opened up the book to Mock's page. And he goes, oh, he goes, he goes, but what's his day job? And I'm like, what do you mean, what's his day job? And he goes, does he work at the coffee roaster? And I was like, no, no, his, his day job is he makes art. And he's like, well, he can't make a living at that. And I was thinking, actually, he can make a living at that. It's just you have to work twice as hard as everybody else. Um, and it's OK to not be a superstar. It's OK just to you know, make a viable income, make a living. You don't have to like suddenly win the lottery. Um, and I feel like in Japan, the difference is, is it's a little bit of a steeper hill to climb because most people are expected to be like a salary man, to be a working, stiff, you know, going to work every day, coming home in a suit. And I know we have that here, but over there it's a little bit more ingrained. And so I feel like the Japanese artists just have an even tougher hill to climb. So Mock, he does tons of different things, like furniture painting, paints offices. He'll do any job he basically can get his hands on to make a living. Um, this is a hotel room in uh, Shibuya that he painted last year when I was there. Um, and this thing is interesting because he invited several of his friends to come in and paint. And there's like this community of artists who will work together. Um, so there's like pulling people up with you is also a big theme. Um, so this kind of leads me into another thing. Because everybody thinks money is not important when it comes to art. They feel like money is somehow spoils art or makes the person less creative or makes them not an, an, a, you know, an, an effective artist in some way, or that they can't have good ideas if they're preoccupied with money. 
Well, um, money does matter. And that's the thing. Every artist I work with, they, it, it matters. They all have to pay their bills. Everybody has to live. And so that may not be their one focus as they're you know, working or doing their job, but it is a factor in everything they do. And so we sort of have to get off this, this element of that you can't let art be spoiled by money. You, you're right. You can't let art be spoiled by money. But you also have to like, be able to supply the artists with energy and food to like make the art. So that kind of leads me into this next artist. This is a page from my new book that's coming out. Um, it's A.J. Fawcett. Look at his crazy writing. Wow. Um, anyway, A.J. makes these beautiful large-scale wooden sculptures. Really well-known guy, sells out tons of shows. So everybody thinks, oh man, this guy, he's made it or whatever. But it's an illusion of success because everybody else in a normal job, they get paid weekly. So a guy like this who's spending a year to work on a show, he gets paid once a year. So imagine if you have to pay for, in his case, he has like a child, he's married, he has a house, he gets one paycheck a year that he has to like make his art and do everything on. So there's like this, you know, it's, it, the thing that kills me is it's like people, they expect like, you know, if you're selling a lot of art that you're like somehow like, like Banksy or something, selling million and a half dollar paintings. Not every artist is like that. You can sell a lot of art and still be working class and still be just struggling to get by. Um, like it's the phrase, starving artist, it's like it's complete bullshit. It's like this whole thing where it's sort of like a, a phrase invented by the rich, in my opinion. It's like about they wanted to like make an excuse for why artists can't be paid a reasonable income there because they want to say, oh, you're starving. The struggle is what lends to your art. Well, it's a construct that doesn't work anymore. And I feel like artists have to like sort of break through that and, under, and, and make people realize we don't, not all artists want to be rich. They just want to like make a living. They just want to be happy. Um, they all do it for the love of it, but they should, get a, should expect to get paid. I mean, the thing is, is you call a plumber to your house to fix like plumbing or work on your pipes or whatever. You don't expect him to do it for free. And you have a lot of respect for him when he's there because you're like, oh my God, this thing is clogged up. I really need it. And you're like, you know, and you respect the guy. And I sort of feel like artists are the cultural plumbers. It's like we need them. We just don't know we need them until we need them. You know, and so when we do need them, we have to keep in mind that respect that we had for them when they came through in the clutch for us, that has to stay in our mind all the time because it's a struggle for these guys. And so let's look at a few more pieces from AJ. Just, I, I stuck on that one slide too long because I love that piece. It was my favorite piece from that show. These things are all made out of like scrap wood. They're amazing, amazing pieces. I mean, each one of these pieces takes him probably about a month to make. And so I don't even, if he had to like break it down into an hourly wage, it, we would all be very sad. So that kind of leads me into my next point. I'm going kind of quick here. I'm supposed to talk for 20 minutes, but uh, this is the first time I've ever done something timed. Um, so maybe I'll just start talking really slow <laughs> and have long, thoughtful pauses. <laughs> so it kinda, that kind of leads me into the next thing, which is likes don't. They don't do a lot of things for you. Facebook, internet, they don't really sell your art. They don't pay your rent. They don't buy diapers for your baby, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody wants them. Everybody wants to feel like everybody likes them. But ultimately, it, I think in a certain degree, the internet has devalued art because everybody sees it on a daily basis. And so it's actually adding one more weight on the back of the artist that he has to overcome, which is, so he's no longer can people see an image at a show opening and be like, oh my god, this is awesome, and really value it. They've seen so much of it on the internet beforehand that it's really nothing new to them. And so it's hard for them to like really be impressed when they see it. And it also creates an unrealistic peer group. Like a lot of the uh, uh, artists, they see 
some other artist in their peer group and like they have so much popularity online and so they're like, oh my God, I gotta do that, I gotta do that. But really, that's really not doing anything to make them a viable machine that can actually like survive, pay their bills, have a long career. And so I think we've sort of broken the measuring stick in the art world at this point, um, the internet has. I think you know we no longer measure things by quality of work, how much time people have put into it, um, what the artist has to say, his point of view. I think we're all just about that splash image now. And I'm guilty of it too. I mean, my God, I'll probably like, I can't believe I haven't taken out my phone and taken an Instagram picture of everybody here. Um, and I might still do that. Um, but the thing is, is like, at the same time, I know I, it's like an addiction. Like I, I'm feeding into that same thing, you know? You know, I'm, I'm feeding into this, this, this culture of instant image, instant gratification without understanding what went into the art, what went into the background of the art. So that's why I develop a relationship with the artists. The artists are the most important, the relationship with the artist is the most important thing to me. Both books are filled with people that I feel like have chosen to walk into the fire. Um, like this artist, this is Souther Salazar. This is his workstation at uh, uh, his studio. He goes through all these things to build his sculptures. Um, and he's like really not the kind of guy who posts online or like gets that involved with the internet. Um, he's more of like a, a hands-on folksy kind of artist. He, and, and so I always feel bad for him because it, he almost has to have other people take over that part of his marketing in order for him to like keep relevant in today's like society. This is his questionnaire he filled out for my book. Might take a long time to uh, figure out uh, his favorite bridge and um, <laughs> what part of town he lives on. Um, this is a piece of his artwork. Souther just did this really great project. This is from it right here. It's called The Trading Tortoise, where he basically went around the country with this tortoise tent that he built. And he asked people to come with something to trade. And then he traded them back a piece of art. So he would just constantly be trading, trading. And it was meant to like start a like vocabulary with other artists and other people about the art. And I bring this up because it's like sort of the antithesis of the internet. It's like he was making friends face to face, not online, by having people interact with him and trade things and trade stories. And it just, it just, it's really amazing. Oh, I love that sculpture on the side. Whew, my God. <laughs> anyway, so my next point would be it's a marathon, not the 20 yard dash. This is like the most common sense thing ever. It's every time I meet with an artist and talk with them, there's this thing, this sort of like, fresh off the bus from Hollywood vibe that's going on, you know, without the drugs and prostitution. It's like people who think that they're just gonna like make something and then they're gonna get in high fructose magazine or they're gonna be like an internet sensation and they're gonna blow up. And I think we've lost track of actually like a career trajectory. Um, and so I feel like that if the artist just really, rather than focusing on making, you know, just this one image focused on a long career, you know, they would like be much, much better off. I mean, everybody wants it to be instant, and nothing's going to be instant. I mean, an artist changes over the years so much. His style changes. Everything about him changes. I mean, he may get married, she may get married, they may have kids, whatever, and the art's going to change. So. You can't really focus on the, at the moment. So I think it's more about focusing on figuring a way to make viable income as you're making your art. This next artist, Shohei, he's from Tokyo. Uh, his father is Katsuhiro Otomo, the director of the film Akira. And in Japan, he's a really, really well-known artist, animator, filmmaker writes manga. And so his son, I actually was at, talking to his son one time about how, why did he cho choose to go into art? You know, was it because of his dad? And he basically told me that he didn't have a choice. 
because he grew up in a household where he drew every day. He drew and he couldn't stop from drawing. And then when he got old enough to understand that he could actually make a career out of it, he realized that having his father's name was actually a little bit of a handicap. So he chose, rather than to use the name Otomo, just to go by the name Shohei. Um, and for him, it was really difficult to go into art because he's, you, you know, everybody's going to judge you by your father, who is like the Walt Disney of Japan. You know, it's like everybody knows his father. Um, and so I feel like he had to like sort of risk everything to go into this business knowing that he could fail and everybody who knew who his father was would like measure him to that and be like, you're, you're, no, you're nowhere near as good as your dad. But he's insanely good. As you can see, these are all ballpoint pen. He draws only with a big ballpoint pen. Um, and all of these are maybe only like 14 inches wide. They're really small pieces. Um, it's amazing. It's really, really amazing. I think the problem is, is like we have, we're right now we're sort of living in a modern day gold rush. Um, we, have, we have all of this press about artwork, and you see it with like Shepard Fairey and Banksy. And so now it's become this thing where everybody is trying to figure out who the next best thing is and who's going to be popular. But it sort of neglects the fact that all these artists are taking a really, really big risk doing this. You know, they, they really are the bravest people I know because not too many people have a job in front of them where they know they're not going to make a lot of money. They know that in general they're probably going to be ridiculed and critiqued over and over, <laughs> torn down, and yet they still choose to do it. Well, there's no money in it, so they're not doing it out of greed. They're doing it because they don't know how to do anything else. And I admire them greatly for this. Uh, I think they're just an amazing group of people, and it's why I work with them. And it's why my gallery is sort of like this, you know, like kind of like a, I, I'm trying to like make my gallery be this thing to, to help these artists get, move forward and do, you know, more things and make more money and have a good life. This is uh, the last image I have of him. Um, he recreated the, uh, one, uh, the 10,000 yen note uh, because uh, uh, he didn't like the uh, philosopher that was on the 10,000 yen note. Um, anyway, my point, I was actually just trying to make the point that these artists have all chosen to walk into the fire. They've chosen to go into battle. And I feel like as a culture, we need to support them more. And I feel like I'm trying to do that. And so it's difficult in a city like Portland where there's not a real like art buying market. And so I'm trying to like foster a market for people to come in and buy art at an affordable price, new artwork of artists they've never seen before, um, people that they've never knew existed, but still need their help. Um, and that's it. <laughs> I don't. I don't, I don't know if that was uh, 20 minutes or not, uh, but um, open it up for questions, if anybody has any questions. I feel like th that's the difference between commercial, like illustration, and artwork. You have billable hours. So it's really easy if you're going to take a job with a, a commercial agency, you say, I don't know, $50 an hour, this is what I'm going to do for this job. Um, but the problem is, is a lot of artists are now kind of mixing into that commercial world, and they don't know how to commodify their talents. And you're absolutely right. Um, I think if you go to a plumber, you know it's going to be expensive. You know, it's like, you know, I mean, that's just the way it is, you know. Yeah, because there's no background. There's no background knowledge base. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I, that's why I feel it's important to actually have a relationship with the artist. Because the plumber, you know what his end product's going to be. Your, your toilet's going to be unclogged. Yeah, exactly. That's right. He's going to install a, a, a dishwasher in your kitchen. And so with the artist, you still want that same deliverable element. But 
you want to know how you're going to get there, I think, more importantly. With the artists, it's important to have a relationship with that. And I feel you're right. There, there is this sort of like lack of uh, self-confidence in artists that sometimes it kills me. I'll, I'll meet an artist, and they'll be like, oh, I don't know if it's any good. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? This is amazing. And I freak out, you know? And they're like, really? You like this? And I'm like, yes. And so will everybody else. And I'm always amazed when there's an artist who doesn't know how good they are. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's hard to commodify art. Um, you know, when I do it with a painting, I basically, first question is, is how, you know, do you want the piece in someone's hand? Do you want the piece? Or do you want to, like, price it at a point where no one could afford it? You know, or, you know, or some people break it down into how many hours they spent on the piece, how many, what the supplies were, if it's sculpture or whatever. I, I feel like that, like, isn't, it's, it's more about the idea. You know, it's not about time. It's not, a, it's, not a, it's not an element of saying, I want to get paid $25 an hour. It took me six hours to make this painting. It's got to be more about blood, sweat, and tears and dumping your whole personality into something. Like, what is that worth? Well, I'm still trying to discover that. <laughs> so. it's, it's, it's hands down the most uncomfortable part of my job. And there's no way getting around that I'm going to be the asshole in that conversation. Because basically, I'm telling them, I'm, my goal is, is I, don't, I, I want everybody to have the art. That's the most important thing. You know, but you're right. I don't want it to be devalued. I, want, I don't want people to get it cheaply. So it's this weird balance with an artist of saying, you're, at the start of your career, you have a long career ahead of you. Why don't we start off? by making this more affordable for people so that we can get this in more people's hands and then you get this, this, this patron. That's what you want. You want someone who bought early on and they become a patron. They follow you forever. I hate the idea of a one-time buyer. Like, it, it never ceases to amaze me when I sell one painting to someone and I'll work with that artist again and that person won't come back and buy again. I mean, it's like collecting. You want to have that constant relationship. And so with me, when I go to the artist, I'm like, look, I think to start off with, it's OK to slightly undervalue your art, to sort of get it in people's hands. I think that's OK. And then you have to have a plan about pushing the price up there. But the problem is, is if you push the price up there early on, there's no going back. Because there's this weird like sort of, there's all these like hidden rules in the art world. And I don't even know half of them. You know? And it's basically one of them is you can never go back. You can never go back. Well, that's, I think that's also bullshit. It's like, you can go back if you change styles. Because maybe you're doing something new, and it isn't the same as the other thing. And so you want to value it differently. So that is the hardest thing with an artist to say, look, I think your art is worth $10,000. I think your art is worth a million dollars. I think you as a person are worth a trillion dollars. But we are trying to like create a sort of steady line for you. And so that's my goal. I'm definitely not the kind of gallery where I'm going to have like a really famous person come in and you know, sell it out and blow it out the doors. And that's what almost all galleries want. And sadly, we've kind of lost track of this original patronage thing that started, you know, I mean, medieval, Baroque, Renaissance. I mean, these are, are things that have been around forever. Career longevity, having a relationship with the artist, not going for the instant gratification of money or fame. Um, and so with the artist, that's what I try to do. I try to like do it in a polite way. And then if, and the thing is with me, the artist is always right. So if the artist comes back with, no, I want that piece to be $10 million, I absolutely will put $10 million on it and I will do my best to sell it and explain to people why it's worth $10 million. And I won't usually go in afterwards and say, I told you so, unless the artist was a really big jerk to me. Then I'll be like, I told you so. But, yeah. Personally, I hate the whole idea of selling out. I think that's, it's, how can you sell out? You can only sell out if you're doing something you don't enjoy doing. So whether I, you know, whether I feel like the artist is not progressing, I sort of can't fault them for hitting on something they like to do and making money at it. And I feel like in this culture, we tend to do that. We don't like people who have success um, to a certain degree. Um, but 
I feel like what usually happens, and I've seen it a lot in artists, they change. They'll have that success for a long time, and then they feel like they're, they are sacrificing it for popularity. Like they have something that somebody loves, and they're like, well, I'm just going to keep making this. I'm going to keep making this. But then they almost always hit a point to where they're like, I am so bored with making this. And so then you got to outweigh the popularity and the money with actually like challenging yourself. And I think almost all artists eventually get to that point. Some get to it earlier. Um, I don't think too many people just set out to make something popular. You know, I think that's almost impossible. You know, unless you're like Barry Gordy in Motown Records or something. You know, you could like you could you could be a hit factory. You know, but I think in art, that's like fairly impossible. You can have some, a modicum of success, you know, you know, but you really, you really want people to like value what you make. And if you like what you're making and it's popular, then you're okay. And I don't really feel like there's a better model for that unless it's some sort of like socialized, you know, if you're, if you're maybe living in like Europe or something where the government will subsidize you to like make art, well, then that's awesome because you can do whatever you want. Berlin is a little bit like that. I mean, Berlin, there's a lot of artists who are able to just do what they want. Um, but the thing is, is doing what you want can make you money. You just got to find that sweet spot. You know, you just, you don't want to ever like try to, you don't want to try too hard. I don't feel personally, I feel like you should just wait, you know, bring the mountain to you, bring the mountain to you. Don't go to the mountain. You know, it's like do what you want and eventually people will find out what you do. And so, I, you know, I can't really fault people for having success and like being popular. Did that answer your question? Yes. <laughs>like blue chip galleries definitely have a level they have to hit. You know, they, they have like a much, I'm super low overhead. I'm a one man show. You know, it's like I rent a small little secret spot in Old Town. Um, it's more about having good walls. And I feel like the higher end galleries really are more and more these days are looking for whoever is the next popular thing. And they got to bring it in because they've reached these margins that they have to make every month. There's a friend of mine who runs a gallery in New York and he was telling me about his margins every month for his shows. And I was just like, I can't even relate to this. I live in Portland. I can get a $5, you know, lunch out of a food cart. You know, I can't even imagine having to spend $120,000 a month on rent and taking care of employees. And so it does delude and cloud it where he's like, he can't take a risk. He told me, he was at my gallery looking through my inventory for artists, and he was like, I love this guy, but I could never take a risk on him. This is awesome, but I could never take a risk because, you know, I can't even have a bad month. A bad month when you have $120,000, $150,000 overhead puts you in the hole. So I feel like there's certain galleries like that, um, maybe not so much in Portland, but they have to like really concern themselves with generating money. And I think it does affect where they're going as a gallery because you, you tend to sweep the new people under the rug. You tend, to not, you tend to not really notice the new people. And the new people are what's making this awesome. It's like, my God, it's like every time I find an artist, I'm just like so thrilled. It's like I, it's like I get to fall in love every day of my life. It's like the perfect job for me. It's like I love these guys so much, and I couldn't imagine having a gallery where I was just like flipping through a magazine and throwing a dart and going, look at that, popular, let's put it in. And so I feel like that sort of does sort of run things. Um, so I feel like I do serve a bit of a, a, a purpose. I'm also a professional at losing money. Um, <laughs> to, you know, this is definitely, I, I, I'm, I'm definitely a, a break even kind of guy. On a month where I make enough money to pay all my bills, pay all my artists, get new artists, travel, work on my books. If I'm like right there even, I'm just like, woohoo, lottery won. So that being said, I, don't, I have low expectations. <laughs> so it's interesting. Uh, it's it's changed. When I first started, it was interesting. It was all people probably between the age of like, like thirty to like thirty-five or some were in that age. But lately, I think because I've started to like introduce newer artists at a lower price point, I've noticed over the past two years. I, I have this one guy, he's a drywaller. That's what his day job is. He's probably like 19 years old. And in the last year, he's probably spent close to like $4,000 at my gallery. 
You know, and that's in the overall picture of things, that's not a lot, but to a drywaller who's only that young and, and he's like found this thing that he likes. He's found this thing that he likes. And so I find that more and more. You know, these young guys and young girls are coming in and they're like, we really want to collect. We really want to do it. And so you have affordable things for us to get into. Um, and then every once in a while, I'll have, if I have a little bit more of a, well, I lack of a better word, like a more mainstream piece, like classical painting, I tend to get an older following for that. Um, but in general, my age has been going down, which I love. I mean, my God, I, I, would, I, I almost want to give it to them. It's like, you know, I, don't, I feel bad taking their money because I'm just like, oh, this is so awesome. You should be rewarded for supporting this. You know, you should get this painting for free just because you came here and took the time and you're, you know, not playing video games and you're not, you know, it's like you're, you know, not that video games are bad. I don't want to get letters from people about blah, blah, blah. But anyway, you know, and I appreciate that guy a lot, a lot, a lot. So I think now my collector base has gone down younger, which is good. We should all support that. But my artist base is all over the place. My oldest artist I work with, Nishi, in Tokyo is... 64, I think. Um, yeah, that guy's awesome. He's been married three times. He's got nine kids, 12 grandkids. <laughs> hey, that's a good guy to go get a beer with when you're in Tokyo. Um, and then probably my youngest artist is 18. But I would even go younger. I mean, I've seen people that do amazing work that are like, you know, that I think, oh my god, I can't wait till you get to come in my gallery when you're 17 and you're destroying everybody. So. I, uh, that's, <laughs> I don't know why. It's like, I think it's because I'm not 20 years old anymore and I don't really give a shit if people think like it, what the people think. I really want, I just really love these guys. I mean, I can't really stress it enough how much I love the artists and how much I want them to succeed. So for me, that's the reward. I love it when I work with an artist and they have success and they do a great job and they have this career and I can see them build and build and build and I become friends with them and their family and we're all together in this group. That's sort of my reward. You know, if I was losing money, I probably couldn't do it. You know, if I was losing money, there's no way I could do it because then I can't even expect my wife to tolerate that kind of nonsense. Um, but I'm usually, like I said, I'm able to break even. I'm really bursting the bubble of this like fancy rich art curator thing, you know. <laughs> but anyway. I think it's just slow and steady wins the race. I think you gotta really think about the future. Don't make bad decisions early on. And I know that's easy to say, because everybody makes bad decisions. But just don't get overwhelmed with like with like wanting to make money. It's okay to work at a coffee house or work any job at, when you're starting out. It's okay. I mean, I, I was a janitor when I was in high school because I wanted to buy a car. You know, it's like it's okay if you want things in life. It's okay to have shitty jobs to obtain those things. You know, because your true heart is in what you're doing. And so, by viable machine, I'm thinking along the lines of. You're, you're not there to be a shooting star. You're there to like contribute. You really are like this like piece to a big puzzle, which is the art community. You're, you're making work, and you're that puzzle. And if you weren't there, there would be a hole. So you want to be a part of that puzzle from day one until the day you die. And that's sort of the way I look at it. It's like you don't want to be, you don't want to be the, 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 the person who like, I mean, it's, if, you're a, if, you, if you have success, that's great. But really, you know, you got to think reasonably about this. You got to think about like where you're going. Some of the best artists I know aren't rich. They're not famous, but they're okay with that because they they love what they do. And so I have that's what I like about them is because they love what they do. I want to love what I do. So viable machine, I think, is more about like generating self happiness and enough income to live on. I don't want to make it seem like you're like producing products or anything. You are the product. Um, did that answer your question? The big, th I mean, we're the mecca for design. You know, I know everybody can talk about New York and San Francisco, but let's face it, Portland is the best. You know, it's like <laughs> we have everything better than everybody else in the country. And I know people watching this video are going to be like, oh, that guy. 
uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes it's easy to pull the Band-Aid off quick. And it's the truth hurts. But that is, that's sort of, you know. And so I feel like we're already solving that problem. Our artistic community is why Wyden and Kennedy, why maybe Ziva, why Nike, why all these things are so respected, is because they're feeding off of what we have here. So they are solving that problem. Because these guys, they could go anywhere for resources, but they just need to look out their back door. You know, it's pretty awesome. I mean, you know, people, it, remember when there was times when there was like a feather in your cap if you had like a French designer or someone from, you know, there was like this feather in your cap. Now the feather in your cap is that the guy who you hung out with at the coffee shop worked on your ad campaign. I like that model. And so I feel like we are, I feel like our artists here are solving that. And I feel also like we're lucky because we have a delineation and yet they all congeal to the same thing. There's like fine artists, gallery artists, there's illustrators, designers, but at some point they all come together. You know, so fine artists get hired for commercial work all the time. Um, so, yeah. But it's an option, which is what I like, is that you know, it's an option for the artist to work commercially to solve a problem. They have all those tools. Yeah, exactly. That's, I think that's why we're lucky here. I don't think we really have that. Yeah. Well, yeah, of course, of course. You know, I don't want someone to like, the guy's like, oh, I want a bunch of Nike guys to buy my stuff, so I'm going to put a swoosh in all my paintings. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, that's, it, it, it could happen. It could happen. You know, it's, I don't know. You know, it's, it's, an, it's an odd trajectory. You know, I, I was a musician most of my life, um, and I played in bands, instantly forgettable bands. Um, you know, did the thing, slept on floors, toured around, um, and I found Portland, and I'd always been interested in visual arts just because of album covers I'd worked on with bands and things, and uh, randomly, maybe eight or nine years ago, someone said, oh, you should curate a show at my space, and I did it once, and it was successful, and then I thought, oh, I like this. So then I just kept doing it and then moving from one gallery to another when someone would ask for my help, and then Eventually, I was like, I don't really need to work for other people. It's like, I sort of know what I'm doing, and, you know, and it's like, you know, and I'm still learning. I mean, my God, my gallery has only been open three years, and since I don't really have a handbook, you know, on how to do this, I make mistakes all the time, but uh, I kind of lucked into it, and I feel fortunate, and I feel like Portland is why I lucked into it. I, I don't think I would have this opportunity in any other city. I feel like the, the, the environment here allowed me as an outsider to come here, you know, 17 years ago and do what I want, you know, which is, you know, it's like the kid, I do what I want, you know, <laughs> I'm that guy. <laughs> you know, I went to Tokyo one time because I have family there. Um, and uh, I fell in love with it. It's like, it's, you know, I've never been a heroin addict. But I'd imagine <laughs> that, that my first trip to Tokyo was that first shot of heroin to the drug addict. Like, I remember on the plane on the way home, like, talking to my wife, going, well, we got to figure out how to come back here, you know? And we're not rich, so we're kind of like, oh, man, what are we going to do? And so eventually I was like, well, since I'm already doing this art thing, I should just incorporate that into it. And then really easily, that fell into my lap. Like, I met one artist, and he, I realized that no one was paying attention to these guys. They were only paying attention to the really famous ones. At that time, it was still, like, super flat was huge. You know, people only knew about Nara and, like, Murakami and these people. And I thought, oh, my God, there's this whole culture of, like, Portland-esque people that are not getting any attention. And in Tokyo, you have to pay to play. You have to pay to show in a gallery. And so it really just keeps everybody down. And so I decided that you know, I could tap a new market and bring these young unknown people here and help them out. And in turn, it gives me an excuse to constantly go back there and eat delicious bowls of ramen noodle. <laughs> so. I do. I used to not, because I used to think that that was like really wrong of me. But then I started to realize, you know, if I have a friend who told me he wants to quit his job to, like, be a stuntman and he just had three children, 
I'd be like, that's probably not a good idea. <laughs> you know, and so I feel like, I feel like with the artists, I have such a re relationship with most of my artists, like a friendly relationship. My suggestions aren't about sales. They're actually like, they're suggestions where I feel like I know their work so well, and they might be hitting a wall. And I feel like I can sort of like, you know, kind of buff out the fog on the window a little bit. I do it all the time. Um, I mean, I never, you know, a lot of times they'll tell me to piss off. You know, and that's, and that's the whole point of this thing is, is like you're trying to get everybody in the room to work together. So I do, but I never tell them like, I used to work at this one gallery where constantly the person I worked with would say things like, you should have them do this. We sold so many of these things. You should have them do this. And I was like, well, I'm, not, I'm never going to say that <laughs> because it's like they, they hit on that thing one time and that was the magic moment. If they feel like they want to do that again, that's fine. But what, what I would do is, is like, you're doing the same thing over and over. Have you ever thought of trying something else? Have you ever tried to try, thought of doing 3D sculpture? Um, have you ever thought of like, you know, just different options or incorporating larger scale or different media? So yeah, I do. I mean, they're all suggestions, you know. Some of the, some of the artists take it, some of them don't, you know. I kind of like it when I, when I hit on something good because I feel like I've contributed more than just being the guy who's selling their work. But. Oh, yeah, without a doubt, I tell people why they need it. And a lot of times, depending on, you know, more than anything, I tell them why they need it is because they need to support this economy. You know, I'm like, don't, don't think of this as a, as, a, as a frivolous buy. Don't think of this as a luxury. This isn't buying a new car. This is actually you developing a long-term long relationship with an artist. You're investing in an artist. So for a small amount of money, you actually are contributing to one of the oldest like trades on the planet you know and I feel like we rarely get that option anymore you know you buy a car you know it's going to be you know a hunk of junk in whatever five years or whatever everything you buy is instantly disposable art is absolutely not disposable you keep it to the day you die chances are you pass it on to your kids they pass it on to their kids they remember you it's a legacy thing so I absolutely talk to people about that. I mean, that's what I want them to buy it. I want them to buy it based on the artist, not just because they think it's a cool image that's going to match their sofa. You know, if they want to buy it, that's great. That, you know, I would never stop someone. I've never said, well, actually, I have said no to people that I didn't like that wanted to buy art. But the thing is, is, the, the thing is, is I, you know, I want people to like, have the relationship with the artist. So I constantly, like, if someone buys it, I want them to meet the artist. I want them to come to the show, meet the artist. I want to have them trade emails or phone numbers or whatever. And so to know that it's not a luxury item, that you're basically hiring a craftsman. And craftsman's not a bad word. You know, people will like, there's a difference between artists and craftsmen. It's, craftsman is a great word. Artists are craftsmen. Did that answer your question? All right. <laughs> um, how are we doing on time? Good. I feel like the question and answer was better than my talk. <laughs> I had a cold all week, and I had these notes, and I wrote some of the notes like under the influence of cold medicine. Like that first thing with Harrison Berger on, I was like, I'm, my mom's going to be happy. I'm like quoting Vonnegut, but everybody else is going to be like, what? You know, so. <laughs> anyway, thanks a lot, everybody.